final of EUDC 2018. Uh, I will first announce the panel of judges. Uh, on this panel we have Amira Moore,
The Me Too movement has been hijacked by sensationalist journalists who do not respect the safe spaces of women who just want to tell their stories. It is a movement that has been timely because women have not been believed for too long, because women have been called out for not coming forward or going to the police for too long. And yet, when they have the safe space, all they want to do is put up, up, up stories on the front page of the newspaper, and they, all they want to do is to be able to take action on our stories, action that we ourselves have not necessarily wanted, nor do we want to take ownership of. The Me Too movement is a movement that fills a gap in allowing women to tell their stories without it being delegitimized, de and allowing women to be able to tell their stories without the emotional labor of having to think about the consequences of those stories, but allowing women to tell their stories without sharing all of the details, because those details that you want to keep private are important to you, but you should be able to tell the story that you want to anyway. On our side, what is the world that we want to live in? We want to live in a world where people know that sexual harassment is common, that it happens in every office, that it happens to too many women, and that is a world that we prefer over having to name and shame people, because we don't think that you get that justice by holding people to account. That creates too much backlash, that creates too much question on your legitimacy, that creates too many attacks on women who only want to come forward and tell their stories. We're happy for all stories to be anonymous, for all stories to not be uh, uh, to not be deemed as illegitimate and therefore unable to be able to take action upon. I'm going to talk about two things. Firstly, I'm going to talk about how this creates the best safe space for women and why the Me Too movement in its current form is exclusionary to women. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about social justice. Let's first talk about why this creates the best safe spaces for women. I think firstly, that when the Me Too movement changes from being an anonymous form of storytelling to one where you accuse people and you put very, very serious allegations on very, very powerful men. The result of that is that they end up targeting you. The only way for those men to be able to defend themselves from the allegation is for them to discredit you and your credibility. That results in horrific personal attacks against women. The same reason why we have rape culture and why we, dis why we say that that's not okay, no thanks, is the same reason why we think the Me Too movement has moved too far and tried to discredit women. When they start asking you about what you wear, when they start asking you about what you're doing, when they start asking you why do you go back to that man's apartment if you didn't want to have sex, when they ask you why you didn't call a cab when you wanted to leave, those are all the kinds of nitpicking and poking holes in the stories of women who only want to be heard. I think this makes it a horrific kind of space for women. Because one, the women who come forward, no thanks, now do not have a safe space where they can be believed. But secondly, I think it means that all other women no longer want to come forward anymore because they don't want to be subject to that kind of public attack and personal brutality. But I think secondly, I think the Me Too movement is important insofar as on, in the status quo, it, it places pressure on the harassers to have to harass the women even more to keep their stories silent. If you are a powerful man facing potential allegations because you know that you did something that was in the grey area, before the Me Too movement happened, you could try to keep your distance from the person if that's what they wanted. You could respect their privacy. You could try to reform your own actions on your own. On their side now, you now want to approach the victim to invade their privacy and prevent them from recovering because you want to make sure that they are silent. You try to pay them off in the same way that Trump pays off porn stars in order to keep potential scandals quiet. On your side, you incentivize the worst of the harassers to bridge that gap that the victim tries to put between themselves and their past experiences. And you cause them to want to invade your personal space in order to keep you even more quiet and even more um, submissive. I think that the Me Too movement on the third level is exclusionary. And I'm going to develop this into a point on its own. Because I actually think that the Me Too movement, one that prioritizes the calling out of public figures, means that the credibility and capital that your story has depends on your harasser being a public figure. You only get that kind of sensational media reports when you can put it on the front page. You only get it when there are media moguls like Harvey Weinstein. And that means that the only stories that get hurt are the ones that happen to the most powerful men, whereas the vast majority of us have been oppressed and have been abused and have been harassed by the common man. I think that their side locks out all women who don't work in the entertainment 
industry. The reason why the vast majority of stories that we hear from the Me Too movement are from the entertainment industry is because you lock out everyone else. No thanks. Did you know that the Me Too movement was started by a black woman four years ago? And the only reason why we all hear about it now is because the journalists who are white feminists that pro like promoting white feminist causes have picked it up and hijacked that movement. That's how it shuns any other story. You start it out of any ability to get attention. Because even if you try to speak out and use the hashtag on Twitter, like it has been used in the past, they ask you, why do you come forward if you're not willing to name the person? Why do you come forward if there are no, uh, there's no ability for consumers to be able to boycott them. And those are questions that I think should uh, your allegations and your testimony should not be credit, uh, predicated upon. But I also think that on their side, they shut out women who don't want to name their oppressors. If your harasser is someone you know, which happens to a lot of women, if your harasser is someone that affects your career, if you come from a conservative family, you don't want to disclose what you're doing at the point of harassment. If you want to keep certain aspects of your story private, those women never get a chance when those stories are being made public and I'm not anonymous. Closing. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry, could you explain for the first time why it is that just because we have prominent women calling out powerful figures, people still can't share their stories anonymously? I think that is about the norms that the movement creates. And if you are going to have a movement that is powerful because it calls out public figures like Kevin Spacey, then any other story that does not fit into that norm is discredited. You say you don't want you to be part of our YouTube movement because you're taking away from that kind of airtime that you have to be able to make the movement more powerful by calling out more powerful men. I think that that's horribly wrong. The last thing I want to talk about is social justice. I think on their side they make far too many enemies for their movement, even in the best case scenario, to be able to make credible change. And the reason for this is because those powerful men are still going to be in power and the anger from the Me Too movement will be directed to the personal, but the personal person that is being named rather than to the system that has created a lack of safeguards for all women in all workplaces. That kind of anger will at best be targeted towards individuals and never a system that is vastly in need of reform. On our side, we prioritize sharing stories in a safe way, in the way that you want for that story to be shared. I'm so proud to propose. Opposition, we invite from the University of Tel Aviv, Noam Dahan. It is, to say the least, problematic to have a movement, a, a coal, an international coalition of women, telling women to share their story, telling women that every woman, that all women are harassed, telling women that they were hurt by men and should speak up about it, but we are not. This coalition of, of women is going to do absolutely nothing about this. They are going to act in no collective manner. They are going to use none of the political power that they use by banding together. They are going to use none of the media attention that they garner exactly by having this on Twitter and exactly by having celebrities subscribe to this in order to stop even one inch of it. And we say first, if LSEA thinks safe spaces are important, we have two contentions. A, that to pretend Twitter was ever a safe space to begin with seems dubious, and B, is that there are things more important than people having a safe space, and that is people having safety. We think that is what wins this, this debate. So, in, four, so uh, in, in the speech we'll talk specifically about the ways in which specifically the, the, the movement not requiring anonymity and targeting specific individuals who have sexually abused women works in multi-layered ways, not only when it's Weinstein, but when it's your boss at work as well. We'll talk about how the movement would have progressed without it, or how it would have ground to a halt without progressing into actually getting the people who are guilty of it. Uh, sorry, does anybody have time? Third final, third time, I don't take that. So, 
Before that, four points of direct rebuttal. So, first of all, uh, the, the idea that women should have a safe space, we say at the point, point. at which this regrets motion happens, at the point at which the turning yeah. point happens, Me Too has already significantly achieved a lot of those things. Second of all, note that the media attention of Me Too as a, mo as a movement for exposing these specific hashtags on Twitter has already eroded. So we say the significant impact of liberating women to feel open about their stories is achieved on both sides of this debate because we have to crucially analyze the point in time in which this shift happened. Secondly, say, and, uh, and secondly to that, we say this is what is unique about having a movement rather than sharing it internally with yourself. Secondly, they talk about discrediting. We say, crucially, Twitter was never a safe space to begin with. At a point at which you say certain behaviors which men, which like some types of men, like not me, obviously, right, but some types of men perceive to be not sexual harassment or just a male way to behave or just flattery, those men are already, like, their personal space is assaulted, their personal identity is assaulted, and they already will discredit you with, oh, what were you wearing? Which what were you on? What time was it of the week? And when you are unwilling to commit to any detail and to commit to anything specific about it, then those men are actually empowered by the fact that you are unable to like prove them wrong in any significant way. You just stood there and didn't talk. We say, this, we say like Twitter is evil, but Twitter is the platform in which this is happening anyway. Thirdly, we say, so Sarah tells us something very interesting, which I think was the debate for OO already. She says, now men who have sexually harassed women will just want to not be prosecuted, so they'll go to the woman and they say, oh, are you, are you sure you're not gonna sue me? Maybe I'm worried about this. We say, Sarah just conceded something very important, which wins us the debate, which is men are now afraid of being sued. This is the single largest impact in this debate, because it means that every man who hasn't yet sexually assaulted a woman, or was thinking in the future of sexually assaulting women, is also making the exact consideration that Sarah said about the man who has already sexually assaulted a woman. So even that specific man badgering the woman he's already assaulted is probably not going to assault more women. Huge impact, the very single largest one in this debate. Uh, we only address the, the, the highest uh, position of men. We say we're, we're going to get to that in argumentation. And only now we're hearing about Me Too being led by a black woman. That's literally a good thing. If we're able to establish more press exposure for the movement as a whole, this enables us to achieve all of our goals more effectively. So, first of all, why does it help when you actually knock down someone like Weinstein? Like, why does it help to specifically target individuals? First of all, we say there is an, an intrinsic value here which should not be, like, undersold. This was a person who systematically harassed dozens of women and will not continue to do so because we have been able to hold him to account. Second of all, this was the single largest news story in the United States, and we say that every single local news wants to replicate that at their at their level. Every single like sub-local news, like the news of a single town, wants to replicate that on their level. Even every single like Facebook page that covers the ongoing things of a certain campus, like I think the tab it is in Cambridge, wants to replicate this media success by finding the people who have done that. So we say it's not just Harvey Weinstein, it's the rich and powerful of every single cast of society. Not just the rich all and powerful of all of society, but... Yeah, you too. No. <laughs> Sorry, that was unnecessarily mean. Okay, so, uh, so, so we think that is the intrinsic value of things. So we think that is the intrinsic value. Second of all, we say there's a crucial deterrence value that happens here. You say if someone as powerful as Harvey Weinstein could have fallen like this, I should be more careful with with how I behave and with how I conduct myself. This is crucially what Sarah explained, but now I'm giving the, anal the analysis for it because I see that even the most powerful of men beca became accountable to this. This makes the threats of all women of I will t tell someone about this more credible because we can see like actually it unfolding in the public sphere how the discredited becomes credible Becomes, the, becomes actual criminal. So we think that is a crucial process that women are able to replicate against the men harassing them in their own lives. Would love to engage with the closing extension or give you a chance to defend yourself, sorry. Uh, why is the response to stories of pervasive sexual assault and harassment to do nothing? Because you regret the shift in the Me Too movement towards publicizing the names and getting actual criminal justice by collective movement action. So we think maybe this would have happened, but certainly the Me Too movement doing this is specifically on side opposition quite clearly in this debate. Just like, I don't know, I read the motion. So, uh, so, uh, and so thirdly, we think there is an inspirational effect. Crucially, what happens when you see the most powerful women speaking out about being sexually assaulted but doing nothing about it, not publicizing the name, not actually pursuing, and not being helped by the women? We think then you say if someone as famous, like uh, as famous as like Rose McGowan, 
is unable to pursue justice, let alone like small, little old me being able to pursue justice. On the converse, we say when you actually see that person getting justice, when you actually see that person putting a very powerful man on trial, that helps you and makes you believe in yourself more. What do we, what, what do we think is the comparative here? We think, unfortunately, the media attention of Me Too as the movement at the point in which this shift, at the point in time in which this shift happened, was already dwindling. The movement was able to, to, to harness more power and to, and to get more exposure by actually putting these large powerful men up to task and we think this is crucially what made the movement more popular was the counterfactual they have to engage with is explain how the movement would have even continued to be a force in, in the public. Thank you. Raise 
of their initiatives and experiences in a meaningful way which lets them continue to actualize and lead their life rather than being judged for being weak and not being strong. This is a good mechanism for social change because it creates the norm of criticizing harassment because on their side, half the people involved in the Me Too movement are for it and half are against. That means for the person who just watches it, um, watches it passively, there's not a clear consensus about what their job and sexual assault is because it gives, it gives the people who are being accused the capacity to defend themselves. Specifically important given they're often the, they are the ones with the most media power, the most influence, the most ability to drown out the voices of the most vulnerable women who want to contribute to the movement but don't get to when it gets co-opted by different people and weaponized against them. And that's incredibly harmful in terms of making social change. I think we get more political capital on our side because we don't make it adversarial, we don't create direct enemies, but also the sheer number of stories you get when people are just sharing their experiences rather than taking the incredibly massive emotional burden on of having to outwardly shame someone given that you can never predict what's going to happen to you. You can never predict what the backlash is going to be. You can never predict if it's going to be successful. There is an incredibly difficult thing to put on women and that becomes the expectation that to be a good feminist in the Me Too movement you have to do this. That is not only unfair but it's exclusionary. They didn't respond to that part of her case and I think that was terrible. Why do we change the movement structurally? Sarah told you it becomes toxic and adversarial in a way that gets weaponized against you. I think it means that we go beyond this by saying you get criticized if you don't come forward to name your perpetrator, which is only effective mechanism, it's easy to achieve in their side. I think they never defend why media structures and political structures are going to be in line with the people who call out on the Me Too movement. Given that, it's easy to access the barrier of posting a tweet. It's not easy to access the barrier of having the capital to be able to push that forward and make it a national scandal. But what it is likely to do is ruin your prospects and your ability to operate in your immediate social circle and immediate social life. Particularly given the perception that when people are called out, it contributes to lag culture because all your mates that defend you and then it creates adversarial in that way. That's why it's exclusionary. And as well, as Sarah said, then it becomes um, it, it, it becomes co-opted by the media who want uh, like scandal and gossip and names rather than a genuine approach on how we can improve um, and improve the problem of harassment and move forward in that way. If they want accountability, I think it's much better for able to um, to be able to do it. In this way. Uh, sure. So unless we see people being held to account. Why will people ever think that calling people out of their actions will actually have any effect in the long run? Because you create the discourse which is supportive to that kind of thing. Okay, that POI relies on the premise that there's going to be enough people held to account successfully that it makes everyone believe that they can do it. I think, firstly, that's just untrue in terms of the fact that you can do it. But secondly, the, re the reason you're able to get change in calling people out is when your other women, if you do it anonymously regardless, around you are saying this is abuse, this is harassment, pointing out to you that's the behaviour you're experiencing. A massive problem with harassment is that most women
it is not enough in this debate to talk about the benefits that we've had from the movement when it started and compare them to some bad thing that might have happened on our sales floor right now. We need to understand that we regret the shift, not the movement itself. On our side opening opposition, we claim most of the benefits have been accrued. We created a safe space. We created a norm by which everyone could be harassed and has been harassed and can come forward and speak. The shame, however, is at the moment we've had that, we need results. We need people to see that holding people, that is not simply accusation, it's not anonymous women, but people actually get fired, go to jail, lose their jobs. There are repercussions to your actions as a man, and that it doesn't end at a woman anonymously complaining about an anonymous man that might not even be you. It is a comparative debate. A lot of the things you hear from the opening opposition simply have nothing to do with it. Under both sides of the house, you won't have any media attention to anonymous women complaining about anonymous men. We want to analyze why specifically it is likely to decrease significantly when you continue to have only that tool. Secondly, even the example of Trump happened a decade before the Me Too movement. There is always an incentive for a sexual assault, that men sexually assault the woman, to silence her. It doesn't change significantly. They will never take the risk. This is why it happens under both sides of the house. We're going to deal with the unique benefit of having the Me Too movement holding public figures accountable, but, we were, but that's going to happen later. Second, thirdly, we say, some of these women who would have complained out in the open against these high public figures are going to, would have, uh, would have been left without any support, would have been left exactly from what Owa would tell them, to personal attacks without other women supporting them, without the movement behind them telling them, no, 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 you cannot just say, I'm sorry, and move on. We prefer a world in which sexual assault, assault never happens at first than a world in which some women have maybe a little bit easier time, uh, having it a bit easier for them to complain anonymously. Just trying to prevent that in advance. Let's start. Let's discuss a couple of things. First, let's discuss what's going to, what's going to happen to the women, to the movement compared to them. Because say that, note, if you have a movement that supports women coming forward talking about sexual sexual assault. Specifically in the society they describe to us, right? Society that is accepted. Society that doubts every single woman and every single complaint. You are likely to suffer repercussions under their side as well. Men say, but why is there no charging? Why doesn't anyone come forward? That happens under their side of the house. What is the comparative, however, then? A, it is a lot easier to lose traction of that movement. There is an extent to which men can say, men can, uh, uh, people can say, yes, yes, we believe every single woman and see nothing happening. No man being put into jail. No woman being actually come forward saying, I am willing to talk about what happened to me specifically, sharing the story with the face of her and the other men. The ability of those discursive narratives to say those men didn't do this is some, uh, some sort of uh, some plot to get attention. That why is it anonymous? Maybe it's not something that is that bad. How it happens a lot more on the reverse side of the house when you don't have a woman that says there are 19 women who have been sexually harassed by that man. We are not going to accept anything and we're going to push forward for them being held accountable. But secondly, we say a lot of their damages happen more under, our, under their side. Know that these public figures, uh, public figures probably know about these women in advance. It's not only about science them, it is about co-opting the movement that is made extremely easier under their side of the house. Why is that? Because it's a lot easier for Harvey Weinstein when there is only one complaint to say this has been a slip up, I've made a mistake, I've been better afterwards, I shouldn't be fired, I have learned from these mistakes. It is only when there is a movement that pushes relentlessly and there's other women, and there's other women with them that he is not able to do that. Also, it becomes a lot easier to have token gestures that we've seen countless and countless of times throughout history to say, I am going to do something in order to change that. It has been such big of a deal. This means, under their side of the house, it is a lot easier for these men to become a part of the movement and hijack it, to not be held accountable in any way, and continue to harass women, to continue to control the narrative about this movement, and create more of the damages that both government teams would like to avoid. Before I move on, CG, an extension. Was it prosecuting a few men at the top the exact sort of outlook, the exact sort of small change that could be the real problem with you at first in your case? 
Hey, this is simply not comparative at the point at which the movement would have just lost traction anyway. We prefer Harvey Weinstein being punished. We prefer men thinking that even the most powerful of men can get away from punishment. Therefore, I am specifically am unlikely if I am not Harvey Weinstein. So it is easier for women under their side of the house. We say, sure, maybe some of these women are higher profile. That doesn't mean that I'm not inspired to think that A, every woman could be sexually harassed even if she is at that position of power, or B, that I'm unlikely to complain myself. And why is that? Because there's a lot of assumptions from all the opposition about what sort of things we're likely to see under status quo and what the movement does. Like women won't be able to complain anonymously. A couple of things of that. A. Most of the benefits there have been accrued. Women feel comfortable, even without the Me Too hashtag, complaining online anonymously and sharing their stories. Do you know why? It's actually because we had a few months of that happening. It's actually because we've had a lot of that already on Twitter, that we've had those sort of benefits. The fact that the Me Too movement has shifted to another point doesn't mean that they are objectively against it. No one said it is wrong for you to complain. And even if they did say so, under their side of the house, it becomes significantly worse when the men charge the women with these complaints. Secondly, note, we just don't accept the assertion that a lot of women don't want to complain with the name, to name the assault, the men who assault them. Under status quo, there are a lot of pressures, they are, they are scared of doing that. We allow them through the few examples that prevent this for, to provide inspiration, through the deterioration, through the time, um, blah, 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 through scaring, I forgot the word, other men from doing so, to, to, to become easier for them to come forward. Even if it is only my boss and not the CEO of an entire company, even if it is only someone from my company, it is easier for me to do so when I've seen examples of men being punished, specifically the ones who are most high up, specifically the ones who have the most defense. It becomes increasingly more likely at our side of our house that the women who need this the most, the women who want to have a name, the women who are willing to come forward and provide benefits, not only for themselves, but for others other women as well to do so. So we think that at the end of the day, under our side of the house, there are still places for women to complain anonymously, but it's a lot easier for the women who want to do so when they want to name the person. It's a lot harder for men to think they are going to get away. It's a lot harder to co-opt the discourse to their side of the house. But third, we just say, under their side of the house, social change is not only from people being aware. It is also for them seeing things happening in reality. Sure, people can be aware of sexual assault occurring and that women are being affected by it, but the importance of seeing the harms done to them by the repercussion of the men. In turn, it is such a thing that the damages that could be done for any man who is found guilty are such and something unique under our side of the house. Propose. Extension that we bring to you from closing government. The print broad 
extension here is that the Me Too movement on side opposition shifts the focus from women to men, as a result of which all you get is a few convictions of men at the top, but no actual legislative change that results in widespread conviction of sexual accusers, uh, sexual assaulters becoming a thing. Why is this the world? Note, panel, that the Weinsteins of this world are seen as pure evil. They are monstrous men who have no shame, who abuse their want power wantonly without any form of restraint. Why is this the kind of story the media picks up on? Three reasons. Powerful men make good headlines. It is impossible for other powerful figures to ignore the accusations because they are often seen by a certain complicit as a association with that individual. And third, because powerful men, because they think they can get away with it, there tends to be lots of evidence of what they have done. But the number of women they have committed these acts against means the evidence piles up over them uh, against them over time. Because if there's no evidence, there's no story for anyone to report on. That is why the truly monstrous and evil men tend to become the ones who are reported on. What does the focus on these kind of men do to the movement? It shifts the movement to this preconceived notion of the problem is only a few men, a few men who are really bad and powerful and who do the a conservative narrative, as opposed to it being a wider societal problem where any man could have done this. But two, it crowds out so many other stories. Only a few are covered and no others are. Why? Because the story of Weinstein was a continuing story over so many months. And that took up all the headlines, but whereas on our side, you get various stories. One makes a headline one day, but also another makes the story, the headline in a local newspaper. But on their side, all newspaper covers one particular story, so that man's the problem, not society. That's the narrative they have to defend that they copped out an opening opposition. But why does this lead to no change in legislation? There are two elements to this point. First, why on our side, where you get various victims giving their stories, you do get legislation. The first point here is that if there isn't one case to coalesce around, if no one can point towards the Wahhabi voice and say, he got convicted, the problem is solved. If you can't do that, Women around the world say, well, where are the results? What is the movement leading to? Why is nothing changing? They can point towards five convictions. On our side, you need actual policy change as an alternative, not because you demand results. But the second thing is, on, 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 on their side, what ends up happening is, even local newspapers end up covering the national headline story of the most powerful figure being accused. On our side, the local newspapers in towns or cities or states cover the local barman or the local councilman who committed an atrocious act and that is what real women on the ground can really associate themselves with or really identify themselves with thinking someone in my community suffers from this as well. Not just someone in New York or in Hollywood, someone far off, who is to begin with, panel, a privileged woman relative to other women because the woman Harvey Weinstein goes, goes after are privileged actresses. The CEO of a bank goes against the vice president, the female vice president of a bank. They aren't the ones the woman on the ground can relate to. The women on the ground can relate to another woman being assaulted in a party by a barman or by a local councilman that she may have wanted to go up and talk to. That's the kind of stories we want on our side that actually help motivate you. But no thank you. On opposition, what do you get? You get first politicians pointing to high profile convictions to show that the legal justice system is perfect. It needs no change whatsoever to actually get convictions because clearly people are being convicted. But two, on their side, on our side what you get is hundreds of thousands of women daily report incidents of harassment and assault. On your side, the case is about five men. Monstrous men don't need powerful legislative change. They only need to be excluded. But on our side, you need some kind of a more mass change to begin with. Why do we get that kind of change on our side. What kind of change are we talking about? We are talking about change, no thank you, in terms of how the, the, the credibility by which police treat women who end up going to the going to police station accusing a man. The changes such as reducing evidential burden in harassment cases. The, tra the change ju uh, judges and the way they are trained and the biases they have so they can spot their own preconceived biases of doubting women rather than men. Those are the kind of legislative changes you need to allow the average conviction of a woman to succeed, right? Because these cases Cases don't have that abundance of evidence that the cases they talk about end up happening. Oh, happening. Uh, happening. Okay. When, when nearly every man in the public eye on the local and national level was discovered to be an harasser from Weinstein to frickin' Louis C.K., you highlighted not only the ubiquity of the problem, but the difficulty in actually getting justice in the harder cases, like the C.K. case. Two things to that. One, you highlighted the fact that the problem existed in the upper echelons of society where men had the ability to get away with the problem. So the local 
man doesn't do anything. But secondly, you show that because they are, are, are targeted, because they are then excluded from society, politicians don't need to do anything else. But when on our side, the narrative is just about the average woman on the ground, anonymous or not, then you need to point towards something else to show that you have in fact gained results. But it's not just about so, uh, legislative change. It's also about social change, right? Because men need to look at the problem and think it is not just about monstrous men, it is also a far more widespread problem. But no, they talk about exclusively about rape or like really bad cases where the evidence is clear. We talk about harassment at a club, the way you approach a woman, the way you talk to her. Smaller cases that men can then look at and read about and then think, maybe reflect on, maybe I am complicit in this because this is how I act. The moment you, if you always look at rape, you think that's the problem, so I did nothing wrong. But if you look at more on the ground stories, you think, well, the problem's actually a scale. It's a spectrum rather than one evil on the end. And that's what leads to men thinking, maybe I've done something wrong here as well. This is not just about going after five men, giving politicians an excuse to get away with that. This is about widespread change proposed. <laughs> Asad for a fine speech. And now to extend the case of closing opposition from the Oxford Union, Rosa Thomas. Why don't women in society feel like they can talk about it? Often we think it's because they feel there is stigma, but often it's because they feel they have no support or they simply can't afford to fight a sexual harassment case and they don't think they have the ability to do this. How do you allow women to do that? It's not by anonymous tweet threads that make people feel better about coming forward. It's about freeing powerful women from their own silence and getting them to support powerless women, fund them and allow them to do things that actually break them out of cycles of oppression. A few things in rebuttal and then we're going to explain how we think this empowers powerful women and the shift has actually allowed women to actually fight these kind of court cases even on the low down levels in society. Firstly, in terms of opening opposition, I think opening opposition's, um, opening, uh, opening's main claim is that exclusion, this is exclusionary because people feel they can't come forward. Several responses to this. Firstly, we think it's clearly still your choice to come forward. We're not forcing people to name people who assault them if they don't want to. Secondly, you can still share stories anonymously. They try and come back to this to our POI by saying, oh, this changes the narratives within the movement. The thing is, often powerful women who have come forward, for example, Rose McGowan, highlights how difficult it was for her to do that and often highlights how much she appreciates that struggle. I think it's wrong for them to characterize the movement as one that then punishes not going forward, and I don't think there was any analysis behind that. Furthermore, often powerful women coming forward forces you or allows you to see how it's possible. The important thing when powerful women coming forward is not that they are powerful, because they were still less powerful than their oppressor. It's not about how powerful you are, it's about the power dynamic, and it doesn't matter what women you are, if you're oppressed, you suffer from a power dynamic, you see that, you know you have the ability to come forward. And we see this in the fact that secretaries of Harvey Weinstein, not just celebrities, have been empowered to come forward by his oppression. But finally and most importantly, look, the Me Too movement, if it doesn't shift, never proves claims. So it only appeals to those who already agree, who are already already in the bubble that appreciates the Me Too movement. That means it makes it harder for people to come forward in hostile environments, the environments they already are the least likely to come forward in. That's why opening lose this debate. Secondly then, looking at posing. I think there's two main points that come out of posing. Firstly, the idea that we only talk about extreme men when it shifts, and secondly, that crowds out stories. Looking firstly at extreme men. I just think this isn't true. Like, if you look at the discussions of powerful men, it's not just Harvey Weinstein. It's also Kevin Spacey, Morgan Freeman, Aziz Ansari. No, thank you. The discussion around Aziz Ansari and powerful men within the media allowed people to talk about exactly what assault meant and exactly the effect it had on people, not just in the case of rape. The important thing about this is that when you have it in a public space, when you have it in the media, it means the men who usually dis